So why should we care about dating? Well, this is one of the world's longest studies on happiness, and it was started in the 1930s by Harvard, and they've since surveyed more than 700 people over a ridiculous 80 years. They followed these people over the course of their lives, and they found that the single most important factor in determining someone's happiness was not how much money they had or what their job title was, but the quality of the relationships that they had in their life. Now, some people think it's strange to be intentional and analytical about how you find a life partner. But the way I think about this is that this is literally one of the most important, if not the most important decision of your life. So in this video, I wanna break down one great way of finding a life partner that literally anyone can do, which is online dating. Now, I'm not an expert on this myself, obviously, but I've interviewed lots of relationship experts on my podcast. I've read a ton of books about dating and relationships. And I also have 10 years worth of personal experience of using dating apps for whatever that's worth. And so in this video, we're going to break down the six step process for how you can potentially increase your odds of finding an amazing life partner in an intentional and productive and effective way. Let's start by talking about that if you're single and you actually want a long-term relationship, why should you consider online dating? And one of the main reasons is that essentially quite a large chunk of your dating pool is actually also an online dating apps. And these figures are rising every year. And have a look at this graph as well. This is research from Stanford that shows how heterosexual couples in the US met. And you can see that in 1995, only 2% of couples met online compared to 33% meeting through friends or 19% meeting at a bar or restaurant. Whereas if we look at 2017, 39% of couples met online. And in the last six years, I suspect that number has gotten even higher. But even with all those stats in mind, I've met lots of people, including some of my friends who felt that, you know what? This online dating thing, it's not ideal. It takes the romance out of it. I would love to meet someone in a coffee shop rather than on an app. And I'm like, cool, how often do you go to coffee shops and strike up conversations with random strangers? And they're like, I never do that. So it's like, yes, of course, in an, in an absolutely dream world, it's a more authentic and like whatever connection when you're not on an app. But in the real world, especially with all of us are busy, especially with globalization and the urbanized lifestyle, dating online is actually a very reasonable way of expanding the pool of prospects that you've got access to. So let's now go over our six step process for maximizing our odds on dating apps. And step one is to select your dating platform. Now, over the last decade, there's been an absolute explosion in the amount of dating apps on the market. So in this video, we are just gonna focus on the big players. This is a graph showing the top dating apps in the US where Tinder, Bumble, and Plenty of Fish seem to be the market leaders. And then on top of these more generic ones, there are also smaller religion specific ones like Muz for Muslims or JSwipe for Jews or Flirt to Convert, you know, apps like that. Now you might think that if you wanna maximize your chances of meeting the one, you should just go for the app that has the biggest number of users like Tinder. But actually each of these apps has a different sort of meta culture around it. And generally, at least in the UK, at least in London, Tinder is mostly associated as being a hookup app. Whereas most most people that I know recently, at least in London, who've gotten into relationships have done so through Hinge. And actually Hinge is the one that I was on for the longest amount of time. If you're new to this dating app stuff, I would say either just go for Hinge, or if you want, you can try Tinder and Bumble and Plenty of Fish or whatever else is out there. And you can just see what you personally vibe with. The other thing that I'd recommend is once you've picked an app, uh, you should buy the premium subscription to the app. Again, people are gonna think this is really freaking weird. Why would you buy the premium subscription? In my view, why wouldn't you buy the premium subscription? This is literally the single biggest decision of your life. And usually the premium features on the apps let you kind of see who's liked you before you have to like them. It just generally also saves a lot of time. And really the thing that I like about Hinge is that it lets you showcase your personality in more of an interesting way than Tinder does because Tinder is broadly focused on looks, whereas Hinge seems to be, I mean, every dating app is focused on looks, but Hinge is a little bit more personality vibey as well, where you can answer these prompts about yourself and you can share a little bit of interesting things that will allow someone to connect with you. Unfortunately, Hinge are not sponsoring this video, but if anyone at Hinge happens to be watching this, then I'm very open to a sponsorship. Step two, build and optimize your profile. Now, there are basically two parts to building an ideal dating profile. Step one is to pick some decent photos, and step two is to use decent writing on the app. Now, there's a few different rules of thumb for picking better photos on dating apps, and I've gotten these from two sources. Firstly, the interview I did with Logan Urie, who is the head of relationship science at Hinge, coincidentally, and also a bunch of blog posts written by photographers who specialize in helping clients improve their dating profiles. So these are just the tips that are out there. Firstly, according to the photographers, you wanna avoid using selfies. Maybe limit yourself to one selfie out of the six photos that you've got. And generally candid photos apparently do better than the photos in which you're posing. Secondly, you probably only want to have one or two group photos because you wanna show that you've got some kind of social life, but you don't want your potential prospects to be thinking, oh my God, like who is the guy or gal in this photo? Thirdly, you probably want to avoid group or individual shots where you are surrounded by people of the opposite sex. Apparently this is because those sorts of 
photos can either come across as tryhard or alternatively, for example, if you're a guy on these apps and you have a photo with a girl or a group of female friends, people might think that you're into the poly stuff, which unless you explicitly want to go for that, like it's not, probably not the vibe you're going for if you're going for a long-term monogamous life partner. You should also consider having one black and white photo, which apparently improves the amount of swipes on your profile by 106%. And then the final tip is to actually test your photos. There are a bunch of websites where you can upload the photos and like random members of the public can just tell you which one is better than the other. Now, once you've selected photos, we then need to answer the prompts. Now, all these different apps are gonna give you various different prompts. And you wanna use these prompts to let your personality shine through. So firstly, you wanna to aim to give people as many different opportunities to ask you questions. And that often means being more specific rather than general with your answers. So for example, a standard prompt on a dating app might be a typical Sunday for me is dot dot dot. Now the majority of the profiles are going to be fairly boring in response to that. They're going to say, I enjoy having a lion. I enjoy having a brunch. I enjoy going to the gym or some kind of variation, which is very general. But according to Logan Yuri, you want to try and be more specific in your responses. So for example, you might be saying that trying to learn a new song on the guitar, Eyes Closed by Ed Sheeran at the moment. And that gives the opportunity for someone to connect with that piece of information. They could message you saying, I love that song too. Or they could message you saying, oh my God, I hate that song. Try this one. Instead. Secondly, you want to try and present yourself as accurately as possible and true to yourself rather than putting on a front. So for example, if you're actually into painting, then adding a photo of you painting would be good because people are like, oh, this person enjoys painting. That's cool. But if you don't enjoy painting or you don't enjoy playing the guitar and you have photos of you attempting to paint or attempting to play the guitar, that's just trying to put on a front, which is not the kind of vibe you want to come across with. Because maybe someone who's super into painting clicks on your profile and they go on a date with you and then they find out you've been lying. And that's like, that's obviously not the aim. I sleepwalk, you see. That's why I wear shoes to bed. And thirdly, you want to focus on the positives rather than on the negatives. So for example, if the prompt is swipe right if dot dot dot, then don't say if you're not a Tory and don't say if you're not into drama because that's emphasizing the negative. Now, one of my favorite prompts on Hinge, for example, is the prompt, I'll fall for you if. And the correct answer to that is, I'll fall for you if you spend a lot of time on Brilliant.org who are very kindly sponsoring this video. Now, Brilliant.org is the absolute best way to learn maths or science or computer science interactively online. And if you mention something like Brilliant on your dating profile, then it's gonna show to potential prospects that you have a very curious and open mind and you enjoy learning new things. And you're probably the sort of person that would have decent earning power as well. Brilliant has thousands of lessons from foundational maths to AI and neural networks, data science, cryptography, and so much more. Now, I love Brilliant personally, and I've actually been using it for the last four years now almost because when I was first applying to medical school, I was torn between medical school and computer science and I ended up going for medicine in the end, which I don't regret, but I never quite managed to explore my love of computer science. But actually taking the courses over on Brilliant on computer science have really helped me level up my own understanding of algorithms and like an introduction to Python and understanding how cryptography and cryptocurrencies work, for example. And especially with the whole AI revolution happening these days, I'm getting a really good foundational understanding of what, what are the basics behind AI thanks to the courses on Brilliant. Now, if any of that sounds up your street and you wanna try Brilliant out for a full 30 days while you're building your dating profile, then head over to brilliant.org forward slash Ali. And if you are one of the first 200 people to visit that URL, you will get 20% off the annual premium Brilliant subscription. And then you can say on your dating app that you are a lifelong learner as well. So thank you so much Brilliant for sponsoring this video. All right, step three is to start matching. Now, first thing to keep in mind here is don't set your filters too rigidly. If you, for example, know that you only want to ever date or marry a Muslim, then, and it's a complete deal breaker for you that not Muslim, then fair enough, you can set a filter on that and then you're only gonna see other people who are Muslim. But if your requirements are anything less than an actual genuine deal breaker for various reasons, then it's worth not setting that as a deal breaker filter on the app. And secondly, when it comes to actually swiping on people or liking them or sending a like or whatever the thing is on the specific app that you're using, you want to avoid a spray and pray strategy. Back in the day, the old game theorists on Tinder were thinking, you know what, if I'm a dude and I just swipe right on everyone, then just wait for people to match on me, then I won't have to waste so much time thinking about the people. But the way the algorithms on these dating apps tend to work is that they value you as a user more and they boost you more if they see that you're actually an engaged user, i.e. you're swiping on a smaller number of people, maybe you're liking them, and then the people that you have a mutual match with on a dating app, you are actually taking the initiative to message them. Now, when it comes to swiping on the apps, it's often easy to find a reason to say no, to think, is this person really good enough for me? But here's Logan Yuri, who I interviewed on my podcast, talking about the difference between an experiential and an evaluative mindset. So the evaluative mindset is, are you good enough for me? Where did you go to uni? What are your table manners? I'm constantly judging you again against this rubric in my head and saying, are you good enough? Yeah. The experiential mindset is I'm going to be in the moment with you. I am going to be looking at cues for how I feel and if I'm having fun and am I laughing, but I'm not judging you. I think we just do so much better when we are in the moment, having fun, letting time pass 
versus when we are constantly evaluating someone. And All right, step number four is to start actually chatting to them on the app. And when we get to this stage, we wanna aim for our mindset to be something like, I wanna have a good text message conversation with this person so that I can hopefully meet up with them. There's not much point in keeping a text exchange going back and forth forever. The point of chatting is to actually meet up in real life. And there's a few best practices for this kind of thing as well. So the first is that you wanna try and make your opening lines a bit more interesting and a bit more unique. So instead of an opening line being like, hey, how's it going? Or how's your weekend going? Which is a super boring opening line and that, you know, again, if you're a dude and you're matching with girls, chances are they've got a hundred different dudes trying to message them. 95% are probably saying like, how was your day? How was your weekend? So it's like, you don't really stand out. Instead, according to Logan Yuri, you want to look at their profile and you want to comment on something a little bit more subtle. You want to take the time to get to know their profile as it were, and see if you can make a specific comment about something. Like if someone mentions Ed Sheeran songs, you can ask them which one is their favorite. Or if someone says they like Harry Potter, you can put a Harry Potter reference in, but like make it a non-obvious one so they know that you actually like Harry Potter and you haven't just Googled some pickup lines from Harry Potter. You're a wizard, Harry. If there's nothing specific that you can comment on on the profile, I actually had a great line that I got a lot of good good responses to, which is, hey, how do you feel about McDonald's drive through on a first date, asking for a friend? And I actually thought this was a pretty good line. I had a way higher response rate to that message than even something generic that I would comment on about their profile. Because it's just kind of interesting. Some people were like, oh yeah, I would totally do that. Some people were like, hell no but at least it started the conversation. The point around the chatting things is that you've got to make the effort to keep the conversation going, even if you're super busy. Everyone is busy. We all have random shit to do in our lives, but if you're gonna take dating and relationships seriously and approach them with intentionality, you've got to devote 15 minutes, half an hour, every single day to reply to messages, to arrange dates, to do the, to, to do the groundwork that it takes to build the foundation of a relationship with a life partner for the future. Step five, going on dates. So the first rule for this is that you wanna to aim to cut to the chase. You don't wanna have a text message conversation going back and forth forever. You should try and ask them out within a reasonable time frame. Now you don't wanna do this straight away because especially for women on dating apps, like there's a big kind of security concern and therefore they wanna suss you out to make sure you, you want a serial killer or someone that's gonna cause significant problems further down the line. So back when I was doing this online dating thing, again, based on all the research and stuff that I've read quite a lot of and interviewed a lot of people of, I would say something like, hey, I'm really enjoying a conversation. It would be great to carry this on in person. Are you up for meeting sometime this weekend or on Thursday evening or something specific like that. And that's nice because you can then suss out as a dude, like it's very easy for me to just be like, yeah, I'll just, I'll just meet up with anyone. Whereas I can see kind of where they stand on the spectrum of like, do they need to get to know me a little bit first to feel more comfortable? Or are they just happy you being like, you know what, let's just meet up for a cheeky McDonald's. Now rule number two is to choose a date that is maybe a little bit more interesting than just going out for dinner. And here is Logan again. The next thing is, what are you actually doing on the date? So many dates are these job interviews where I sit across from you and I say, what did you study and why? And how many siblings do you have? And what's your five year plan? And you know what, who cares? That doesn't really affect our ability to be in a relationship together it's dry, it's boring. Coffee dates that feel like job interviews all fade into the same. Why can't we do an activity together? Why can't we meet up in a park and run around and try to pet five dogs? Why can't we go to a street with a lot of dumpling places and create our own dumpling tour and figure out our best one? Why can't we have an experience together where we're doing something, we're having fun, even if we don't have a connection, at least we had a fun experience together and it takes the pressure off. So designing a date with a lot of fun and playfulness. Rule number three is to always go on the second date. One of the things that you you talk about in the book is to always go on the second date. What's the deal with that? <laughs> the next thing is that in dating, I think we put too much pressure on the first date. Some of the best people I know do not perform well on first dates. They are awkward. They are not comfortable. They are not good at small talk. They are more introverted. This is harder for them. But these are people who would make great long-term partners. And so how can we actually take the pressure off the first date and say, First dates are almost a warm up round. It's, do I like the sound of your voice? Am I attracted to you? Do we have something to talk about? And I'm gonna assume that we're gonna go on the second date pending that nothing crazy or terrible or unsafe happens on the first date. And that way, if you go in assuming you'll go on the second date, you're giving people more of a shot and it's easier to find those diamond in a rough people who get better over time. And then finally, step number six is to reflect on the experience intentionally. And the evaluation process here and reflecting on the date is less about what were the specific things I liked about this person where you're trying to kind of assess them as if it, it was a job interview. And it's more about how did you feel as a result of that interaction? Did you feel energized or did you feel drained on the date? If you felt energized, that's generally a good sign. For evaluating a date, I've turned it into these list of eight questions. Things like, how did I feel in my body around this person? Do I feel curious about this person? What side of me did this person bring out? And then throughout the date, 
you aren't looking at their height and their job, you're paying attention to those things. And at the end of the date, you ask yourself the post date eight to decide, do I want to see this person again? So I was personally in the online dating world from basically when I went to university and for like 10, 12, 13 years beyond that. But around 18 months ago, I actually met someone not through a dating app and we've been together ever since. And actually one of the books that really helped me was Logan Yuri's book, How to Not Die Alone. And if you're interested in my summary of the book and the lessons I took away from it, check out this video over here in which I talk about kind of the main insights from that book and how it completely transformed my love life. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you hopefully in the next video. Bye-bye.